Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with Kevin B. Smith, who is the author of the brand new book, The Jailer's Reckoning, How Mass Incarceration is Damaging America. Kevin Smith is also a professor of political science at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. Uh, Kevin Smith, welcome to Talk World Radio. Well, thank you, David, and I do appreciate the invitation. Well, I appreciate you coming on, and I very much enjoyed the book. Um, One of the many interesting themes in the book, I thought, is that, as with capital punishment, minimum wages, taxing the rich, voter registration being automatic, thousands of things, locking people up in prisons varies greatly by state. Uh, We talk about this national problem, but it varies by state, and it's not that hard to guess which states lock up the most people. Uh, and even the least carceral states in the United States are worse than most other countries. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, no, you, that's exactly right. I mean, one of the you know, uh, things that I think gets lost in the debate over mass incarceration is this really isn't a national problem, it's a state problem. And you know, at the top end, some states are incarcerating at rates that are equivalent to you know, places like Rwanda or or Russia. And on the bottom end, you're right. I mean, they're still incarcerating at at rates that are greater than comparable liberal democracies, but they're closer to France or Germany than they are to Rwanda. Yeah, so huge variation. Um, Before we get to what you think correlates with or causes more incarceration in certain states, I think we should probably note that not on the list of things that we are, are the things that we'd like to imagine are being done, like restitution, reconciliation, rehabilitation, or even deterrence. We, we know that mass incarceration does a great deal of harm at enormous expense, but the good it does seems to be pretty limited, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's sort of like debatable from an ideological uh, standpoint, from an empirical viewpoint, the payoff of mass incarceration is, is is pretty dubious. I mean, one of the things that I talk about in the book is what I what I call the tuna fish sandwich test. Um, and there's a guy, Larry Dayries, who got locked up for 70 years in Texas for stealing a tuna fish sandwich. And that individual is going to cost the Texas taxpayers at least a million dollars. And, you know, the tuna fish sandwich test is really, is it worth it for the taxpayers to lock a guy up for 70 years and spend at least a million dollars to do it for stealing a tuna fish sandwich? And I I don't think you've got to be a super fan of lunch counter larceny to think that, you know, that's a little that's a little nuts. Now, are there some people that, you know, that commit egregious acts of social predation there? killing people or raping people or anything, you know, is society justified and confining them behind bars? Sure. But I think there's a reasonable case that mass incarceration in the United States, at least in some states, has been has been overused. I've had some authors and professors uh, on this show who've looked at the statistics and said there just isn't any debate that childcare and schools and living wages and healthcare and job training would reduce more crime, would, would prevent even the theft of tuna fish sandwiches at a much less cost, uh, much more effectively for, for a lesser expense than locking people up. I mean, th- th- is there any debate about that? Well, I think there is a debate. I'm not sure that it's an empirical slam dunk. I mean, I think there's a defensible argument that there are other causes of of, you know, uh, people committing crime. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, the environment matters, right? I mean, you know, the number one recipe for for uh, crime in a community or in a society is young men standing around on street corners with nothing to do. Um, and, you know, that's not a demographic issue. That's a human issue. I mean, young men are, you know, they they tend to have more problems with impulse control, they're more likely to resort to uh, uh, violence to resolve uh, uh, conflict. So anytime you've got a situation where you've got lots of young men sitting around with not much to do, you potentially have a social problem. So Kevin Smith, you're a 
professor of political science, I think you could also very well be a professor of statistics. I mean, this book, uh, the core of this book seems to be looking at the statistics to try to figure out why do these state governments do what seems to be a rather stupid thing. Uh, and you've come up with this list of factors, uh, eight of them in a chart in the book that, that correlate in some way with incarceration rates. Uh, and the first one on the on the chart is is inequality, um, which seems to be a, a much bigger problem if, if we were to try to address it than, than you know, cr criminal punishment uh, policies, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the chart that you're referring to is, is basically what I tried to do is I like tried to take the primary arguments or theories of why we've locked so many people up and sort of like let them duke it out in a series of statistical models. And you're right, one of the things that sort of like really popped out of that statistical analysis was uh, inequality. And the basic argument there is the more inequitable a society is, the more social um, uh, trust it lacks, um, the, the less cohesive it is. And that sort of context tends to encourage governments to you know, uh, tighten the screws a little bit to be less lenient about people who are drifting up to or even beyond, you know, the line of the law. And it, it makes sense if you're trying to figure out the national question of why would the United States be locking up more people than most, if not any other country, the United States is also more unequal uh, financially than most, if not all, than any other wealthy country and then some some quite poor countries, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it, I don't think it's, I mean, inequality is, is a real issue. And I mean, I think that is, uh, you know, a real predictor of uh, the mass incarceration problem. But, you know, another issue is diversity and not just demographic diversity, but ideological diversity. I mean, you know, some states lean more conservative and those states tend to lock more people up. Um, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book is, you know, whether you or not you end up in a prison um, and, and, and being incarcerated is not what you do, it's where you do it. Um, and the United States is a little bit unusual like that, that, you know, you can do something in Texas and be locked up. And if you did the same thing in Maine, you would not. Are we on to the second factor in that chart now, the one called culture, meaning the culture of the state government? Yeah, and I mean, this is something that I'm not sure a ton of people um, know about, um, sort of like in a comprehensive sense, although I think plenty of people intuitively know it, but different states have different cultures, right? I mean, you go between Southern California, rural Texas, and New York City, and I mean, I think you can pick up on the vibe. It's a it's a different uh, political culture, and one of the things that state scholars have spent a lot of time investigating is where the people have really different values and attitudes that are sort of like institutionally uh, embedded and generationally reproduce themselves in the states in terms of orientation towards government and what it should be doing. Are and we, they've generally concluded that absolutely is correct. And variation in political culture across the states is a pretty darn strong predictor of whether those states are locking up large numbers of their citizens. Are we talking here about the culture of the general public or about the culture of the government? Because some of these state governments, I would argue, do a incredibly horrible job of representing public opinion on many issues. And I'm not sure that all 50 states fail to the exact same degree at representing public opinion. So which are we talking about here? Yeah, I think we're talking about both. I mean, you, your point that, you know, uh, legislatures are not fully representative of the, the public at large. I mean, I yes, I, I think you're you're correct on that. But I think it's also true to a, to a large extent that the institutions of government do reflect the political culture of the do reflect the political culture of the states. And I mean, the classic example of that is Southern states. Um, you know, Southern states have what political scientists call a traditionalistic political culture. And, um, you know, you can kind of like see that in, in terms of path dependence is Southern states have had high incarceration rates, you know, for a long, long, long time. 
and they seem to um you know be uh continuing that that trend generation after generation and some of that is at least partially driven by you know some pretty deeply embedded attitudes and values about you know what should happen to people who break the rules and you know um how long they should be locked up for yeah um the 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 third factor on that same chart is is actually the crime rate uh which seems not a totally arbitrary or crazy thing to have on there but uh i think you also point out in the book that that was a correlation with incarceration rates up until this new century the past couple decades and it and it really isn't anymore is that right yeah that, that, that's right i mean uh, uh crime especially violent crime is a strong predictor of uh uh you know incarceration rates and that's kind of almost true by definition over 60 percent of people who are incarcerated in state institutions are there because they've been convicted of a violent crime um now the correlation between violent crime and incarceration rates you know you'd expect that to be positive right more violent crime uh, more people locked up um but yeah there there are some years um where across the straits that correlation turned negative um you know in other words um violent crime was going down but incarceration rates were still going up yeah now, people with, uh, you know, who believe in the deterrence argument would say that that is evidence that mass incarceration is squeezing um, violent crime out of society, that you lock enough people up, you suppress um, uh, violent crime. That, needless to say, is a pretty controversial, you know, a pretty controversial thing to say. But I mean, there is there is some evidence um, for it. Um, I think a, uh, you know, uh, broader explanation is that there's a number of other factors going on. Like, for example, we're an aging society and uh, crime tends to be something that's committed by younger people rather than older people. And as, you know, states, as their populations get older, crime is going to decline you know, regardless, because, you know, people like me, 60 year olds are, aren't out on the street, you know, knocking over 7-Elevens. I mean, we just haven't got the gas to do it anymore. Yeah, I guess I, I, what I really want to know is if child care and schools and health care and retirement security would work better than locking people up why won't these state governments do it and why is is culture and all these other factors we haven't got to most of them yet i realized uh, a sufficient explanation for why they won't do it uh i, I mean it, it's like trying to explain it and, and i come down to either stupidity or or malevolence as, as is the choice with so many things well, I, I think I can. L let me take a stab at answering that question, David, because I, I, I think it's an important question. Um, I think you can explain it at least partially from the perspective of it's just legislators being rational. Um, because criminals are not a really good constituency to advocate for. And if you do anything that even hints at this is going to help out criminals, this is good for criminals, that is uh, effectively an electoral loser if you're, you're looking for uh, an elected legislative position. Now, some of the programs that you're talking about, I think, A, can be pretty effective in heading off um, uh, crime. Um, you know, I think part of the problem is they're not sexy in the sense that, you know, this isn't something that a state legislature is necessarily or a state legislator is necessarily going to get uh, a ton of credit for. I mean, one of the things that I talk about in the book is there are a number of after school programs where there have been studies and they show that, you know, these after school programs can really make a difference. They can depress crime rates in a community to a similar extent as, you know, uh, instituting a heavy police presence. And I mean, that's a real payoff, right? Um, but yeah. they're not as visible. Um, they're far from 100% effective. Um, and, and, and because of those reasons, I think they kind of fly under the radar 
but I, I'd agree with you 100% that, you know, some of these programs need to be given, um, you know, a, a little bit more of a try and a little bit, uh, a little bit more support. But I, I don't think it's just, you know, I don't think it's just stupidity on the part of legislators. I mean, you know, legislators are, you know, fairly self-interested in this, in the sense of their, their, their behaviors. Um, you know, they they tend to be motivated by the desire to get reelected. Right. And if they're seen as doing anything that would be hinting that it's soft on crime, that's that's probably not a not a winner if you're looking for votes. I think there's a lot of evidence that you're right. I think in recent years in the U.S., there's been something of a mini trend of electing some district attorneys who were soft on crime and intent on smart policies that would actually reduce crime. I, I had on this program a district attorney from San Francisco who was elected on that sort of platform, did what he was elected to do, crime rates were going down, and he was still recalled and voted out in a special election because he wasn't tough on crime. That is, he was reducing crime, but he wasn't being mean enough to criminals, and they voted him out. Yeah, and one of the things that I find in the book is, you know, one of the hypotheses I, I sort of like really dig into is, is what's called the democracy in action hypothesis. In other words, why do we lock so many people up? Basically, because we want to. Um, because you know, uh, voters essentially reward the behaviors in elected representatives that result in uh, locking a lot of people up. And district attorney is, is one of those. I mean, you, you know, it's much better to run, if you're interested in winning election, it's much better to run on a platform as vote for me, I'm going to be tough on crime than, um, you know, any, any other alternate. But it's not just district attorneys. I mean, one of the things that I find is that states that have elected judges tend right. to have higher incarceration rates because even in a, you know, uh, sort of like a merit system where a judge just runs for retention, they're not running against um, uh, an, a, an opponent. Even in those states, they tend to have higher incarceration rates. And there seems to be a concern among anyone who's elected, you know, I, I don't want to be pinned or run the risk of being pinned as being soft on crime because that literally could cost me my job. Right. This was the next factor on the chart, elected judges. So you mm -hmm. have to not elect your judges or elect them to be something a little different from what they are. Uh, and then the next factor is is political partisanship. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain that one? Yeah, and that one's fairly straightforward. I mean, conservatives tend to be more law and order oriented and, you know, much more of a you do the crime, um, you do the time. And if you you know, bro break the rules, then, you know, no ifs, ands, or buts, you, you got to pay the price. And, you know, especially if you cross the line in any sort of like violent way, we're going to, we're going to bang you up. And, you know, people who have, or states that have more progressive con constituencies tend to be a lot more lenient along those lines, tend to be more open to sort of like considering, you know, alternate methods to, or alternates to incarceration. So this is an actual difference between Republicans and Democrats in this country. Yeah, or level. conservatives and liberals, which is effectively the same thing these days. Yeah. Um, the next the next factor is one that I think many people would have expected uh, deals with race, uh, with black male population, I think. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, there's no surprise there. Right. I'm, I'm a, a long way from the first researcher to sort of like point out the dam the demographic imbalances and in incarceration rates. I think one of the things that people might find interesting about the book that they might not find anywhere else is the political ramifications of that, because the disenfranchisement rates amongst African-Americans and specifically African-American males in some states are jaw dropping. Um, in some years in the 20th, 20, uh, you know, the last 20 years in Florida, you know, the, the, you, the highest estimate that I came up with was something like 32 or 33 percent of African-American males were ineligible to vote. And, you know, you can argue about the, you know, the justifications for um, why they were convicted of felonies. But, you know, even setting that aside, if you have a demographic that 
de jure by law is prevented from voting at rates of one out of three. I mean, that suggests to me that something is a little out of whack down in the engine rooms of, 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 of democracy. And, and that has, you know, that has spillover effects. Um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the, the, the book is it's not just who we're locking up. It's, you know, most people who were locked up are released to the general population again. And when they go back into the general population, some of their attitudes and values change. I mean, as a result of their experience with the criminal justice system, they tend to be less trusting of the political system. They are less civically engaged. And sometimes they are legally prevented from voting. And that can actually affect election outcomes. State, a lot of states increasingly are restoring those rights to vote, at least post-incarceration, at least in theory, if not effectively communicating it to everyone. Uh, it, it, and I imagine that trend, uh, if you drew that map of states, there's some overlap with the states that actually have the lowest incarceration rates, probably. Yeah, and I mean, and the, there is sort of like a, a broad scale movement to re store voting rights to people who have, have served their time. And we just did that in Nebraska, where, you know, um, you know, if once you serve your time, you can have your voting rights restored more or less immediately. And it used to be you had to wait two years to um, uh, petition to get the, the franchise restored. But even in states where they are restoring fran uh, 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 restoring the franchise to, to people who um, you know, gotten out of prison. I mean, some of these states are finding ways to continue those restrictions. Florida is the poster child for that. Um, uh, but even if the voting rights are restored, basically what happens is that population is much less likely to exercise their uh, voting rights than the general population, like drastically so. Yeah. Yeah, um, there, I want to. There's a couple more uh, factors on this chart I was looking at. One is uh, diversity, uh, and one is conservatism. Uh, can you talk about those? Yeah. So uh, if you've got a more diverse population, um, often what you and we're talking about demographic diversity, especially racial and ethnic diversity here, um, you tend to have less social cohesion and less so social trust and you know societies that um you know sort of like reflect those sorts of dimensions are much more likely to go harsher on rule breakers um and so you know i don't think that one was um uh, super surprising and then conservatism it's it's the same sort of thing i mean conservatives are you know, as I was saying earlier, law and order types and are, you know, much more comfortable with locking people up who, who break the rules. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of people who are concerned about mass incarceration are concerned about uh, the profiteering, the for-profit prisons, the money recycled into campaign contributions, as we call it, and just the, the jobs programs. The, I don't want to close a prison. Those are jobs in my district yeah. and so forth. That stuff doesn't seem to come up in the book. Is that is that really too small to, to be a factor here? or? Well, in, in terms of sort of like, I, I didn't really sort of like focus on the prison industrial complex because, you know, some of that varies so much from state to state. And if you look at the, the total numbers, it's a relatively small percentage overall who are locked up in um, private prisons. One of the things I do look at, though, is, you know, what's known as, as penal Keynesianism, which is sort of like what you're talking about is, you know, can prisons serve as a way to boost um, the economy? And the way that's typically done is, you know, there's nearly 2 million people sitting behind bars in state institutions, and they can be a huge pool of really cheap labor. And this is constitutionally allowed. I mean, we ban slavery except for penal servitude. And, you know, one of the things I, I, I talk about in the book, I got kind of fascinated with these firefighters out in California who are inmates, and they're fighting fires for two bucks a day. Yeah. Um, but the, and, and, you know, and some people argue this is a good thing because basically what it does is it's this huge cheap labor pool and that huge cheap labor pool can 
help run prisons. You know, they can serve in the cafeteria and run the libraries and whatnot, and that won't ca cost the taxpayers much. And they can actually sort of like be rented out to private corporations who um, uh, use, use the cheap labor. What I argue, though, is that that labor pool is completely fluid. And you bring these people into prison, then you get them out of prison. And effectively, what happens is their economic opportunities get pretty constrained. Um, so yeah. sometimes you learn a valuable skill in prison, like how to fight fires. And then you cannot put that skill to use because you can't get hired because you've got a felony record. And effectively, what mass incarceration is doing is it's serving as sort of like an unrecognized labor market regulator. Um, you know, we can't, the market can't officially allocate people to skills and economic opportunities that they're qualified for and that, 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 that they could do. And I know that's starting to get a little arcane and a little technical, but, but here's the bottom line, is it can shave a percentage point or two off of the gross state product of a state. And yeah. you take a state like California, that's the 11th largest economy in the world. You take, you reduce its gross domestic product by a percentage point or two, and you're talking about a lot of money, a lot of money that's, that's, that's you know, not going to be there because of, of the scale of the mass incarceration problem. And Californians have on the ballot on November 5th banning slavery, even for penal servitude, uh, which if they vote the right way, will be at 16 states left that haven't done that. Uh, but then you still have the question of whether the minimum wage applies and so forth. The, the director of prisons in Arizona this week said that communities across Arizona would simply collapse without cheap prison labor, yeah. uh, which seems uh, morally disgraceful to me, apart from what it does to people's future job prospects. Um, we've got just uh, just a minute left. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of the, the, the morality of this whole business? Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a, a moral question when you're locking up such a large percentage of your of, of your citizens. Um, and I think this is not just a moral question. It's also a fiscal question and it's a political question that is of relevance to all of us. I mean, you know, the reason I called the book The Jailer's Reckoning is because it's a reckoning for all of us. We all pay the costs of mass incarceration whether it's politically, economically, or, or socially. Absolutely right. It's a wonderful book. You should run out and get it. Uh, the author, Kevin Smith, uh, has been with us, and the book is called The Jailer's Reckoning, How Mass Incarceration is Damaging America. Kevin Smith, thanks for writing this book and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.